And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. May the Lord bless His Word. You may be seated. Praise God. Very familiar passage. I would like to speak to this assembly tonight in the vein of what some of the speakers to come later in this conference will be preaching and teaching in in that vein. The environment conducive for evangelism and church growth. I believe all would agree that the birth of the Pentecostal Evangelical Church was born on this day that I just read to you about. Y'all read it with me. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. And, and the reason I say that is because Jesus had told them before He sent them out to evangelize the world to go back and to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. How many know it takes the Holy Ghost to do the work of the kingdom of God? Hallelujah. And, and God's fire, I've noticed all through the scriptures, has, has come with a spontaneous phenomenon that confounds and amazes those that are fortunate enough to behold the mighty work and the miracle that God does. But after that initial outpouring and that miraculous move of God that, that always moves in the fire. Then there comes a command and a challenge and a commitment for the believers to be the maintenance or the maintainers or the keepers of that fire. Can somebody say amen? amen. Praise God. I need to be, I, I, I realize I need to be quickly here. I, I sounds like that the heavy hitters are all, already uh, uh, scheduled for a, uh, the service tomorrow, and, and we don't know how long they're going to take, but I want to, uh, I want to give them plenty of time, and I don't want to be weary on your time, but I want you to look with me, again, if you have your Bible, in uh, the book of Leviticus, chapter number 6, Leviticus chapter number 6, I'm taking you to the Old Testament, and I will begin reading at verse number 8, listen to what the words of God says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and shall put them beside the altar. You know, he's, he's being very specific. And shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay a burnt offering in order and in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat and the peace offerings. The fire, listen to verse 13, the fire shall be ever burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Very specific, isn't it? Specific about the fuel. Specific about the wood. Specific about the, even the ashes. Specific about what garments to be worn while you're doing the work of the, of the tabernacle. Praise God. You know, God, God, God is very, He's very, uh, he, he is very, very particular. And, 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 I, and I understand, I, I want to say this back with what I've already read in Acts chapter 1, uh, along with what Pastor said a while ago. You know, the, the only thing where I pastor at Bethany and have for many years, the only thing that has been constant, Pastor, has been change. In the New Testament, they had to change. Quickly from the day of Pentecost, it wasn't long till there was a legitimate complaint among the widows that they were being neglected and they had to select deacons. Are y'all still here? Yeah. Acts chapter 10, it really changed. 
Because God was fixing to do something in the house of Cornelius. Amen. So, so listen, we, we must be able to detect the difference. Now, I, I, don't know, I don't know if this is what you expect here tonight, but I, I just feel like talking to you from my heart. We must be able to tell the difference and know the difference and discern the difference between change and compromise. Praise God. I mean, the New Testament church was, it was constantly changing when, when it had to. And it'll change at Revival Tabernacle, and it'll change, and it'll change. And we, we have to change. every. You know, we're preparing for, we're going to be starting school this week. We have a Christian school. Things have changed from last year. It you know, changes. It, it just, we're going, to, we're going to do things a little bit different. You have to do that. And people that are not willing to make that change are not going to be able to work, do the work of the kingdom. But there are some things that do not change. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, and, and, and one thing is that what God has given us through miracle and miraculous and, and, and spontaneous and outpouring and, and it's a great phenomenon and it's supernatural and, and we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to deal with it. We don't understand what God's doing. I mean, God expects us to keep going what He has begun in our life and in our work and in our ministry. Oh, I hope I can help somebody here tonight. <laughs> it was the responsibility of the priest to keep the fire burning. <laughs> Let me tell you something, families, moms, dads, dads especially, it is your responsibility to keep the fire burning in your home. Mamas, if daddies won't do it, it's your responsibility to make sure the fire is burning in the home. Pastors, it's our responsibility to make sure the fire is burning in our ministries. And in our churches, it's, it is our responsibility to make sure that the fire is ever burning. <laughs> why is God so demanding about this fire? I'll tell you why. It's real simple. Because fire has a tendency to go out. It doesn't matter how great it is. It doesn't matter how miraculous it is. It doesn't matter how spontaneous that God done it. It has a tendency to go out. And unless you do something to maintain that fire, it will go out. It's really profound, isn't it? There must be something put on that fire to keep it going. The fire of prayer and devotion must be fed on your altar or your fire. It doesn't matter how good you got saved or what changes God brought about in your life unless you put wood on that fire. It will go out. Praise God. Two things the priest had to do besides the attendance of the, of the tabernacle. There were two things. I've already, already read those two. You don't want to spend too much time staying here too long. The, the, they did have the care of the offering and the burnt offering and the fire. Two things very specifically. The two that I want to deal with tonight are the wood and the ashes. The wood had to be brought in. Come on now. You know, I didn't know you was going to hit on this. I'm talking, this is the change you're talking about. The wood has to be brought in, and the ashes have to be taken out. <laughs> Boy, this is real deep preaching, isn't it? You, you know, you got to, and before, really, before you can put the wood in, you got to take the ashes out. I know there's a lot of definitions for ashes. One of them that, that I could use is ashes are yesterday's fire. Ashes are yesterday's sacrifice. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what God, what all He done and what all He accepted, by the time it's burned all night long, it's nothing but ashes. Oh, God. The reason some churches can't grow, the reason some churches will never grow, the reason some people will never have revival, they are not willing to remove the ashes of the past. They're not willing to scoop them up and take them out and, and, and get ready for God to do a new thing. Hallelujah. God wants to send new fire, fresh fire, holy fire, anointing fire. He wants to do it, but He will not do it until the ashes are taken out. 
Oh, I'm so glad for what God's done in my life. I'm glad for the miracles He's done in my life. I could stand up here and tell you things God's done in my family and God's done in my church and God's done in my ministry. Amen. But I want to tell you something. The most important service I've ever been in in my life is this one right here that we are having tonight. Amen. And God wants to do a new thing. God wants to do a holy thing. God wants wants to do a supernatural thing and he wants to do it here tonight my friend you'll not get it done you'll not get that renewing that restoring amen somebody's saying I wish I could feel it like I felt it when I first got saved I can tell you how to get that feeling before this service is over get the ashes of the past out of your life and put on some new wood and God will send his fire and pour it out on you and you'll say I feel as good tonight as I did when I got saved Woo, hallelujah. Oh, man, I'd like to just cut loose and preach right now. Oh, help us, Jesus. God's trying to do something here tonight. Man, we've got to talk about the ashes. First, they are yesterday's fire, and we've got to take them out. Man, the revivals of the past are not saving our children. The revivals of the past are not growing our churches now. Oh, God, help us here tonight. Uh, amen. Uh, the revival you just closed. Uh, the fellowship meeting we had last year. Uh, the conference we had here a year ago. Uh, nobody can get saved in that one. Uh, amen. It's in the past. Uh, thank God for what I learned. Thank God for what I gleaned from that. Uh, but I've got to put that in the past. Uh, and I've got to clean my altar off. Uh, and I've got to bring in some new fuel. Uh, and I've got to believe God for another outpouring. Oh God, let the fire fall. Let it fall in Revival Tabernacle. Let it fall in Richmond, Kentucky. Let it fall in Sand Springs, Oklahoma. Let it fall at Bethany Holiness Church. Hey Amen. What are we going to do to get it to fall? Let's clean up the ashes. Let's take out the ashes of the past and get ready for God to do it all over again in our life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. People can't get saved in yesterday's revival. It's time to take out the ashes. Amen. Let me say something on that note now. I, don't, I, I do not discount or discredit the revival of the past generation. I do not make fun of brush harbors. I do not make fun of the moves that happened in the woods and the backwoods, some of the first camp meetings amen, that we can read about when you read about the historical moves that happened in the United States happened right here in the state of Kentucky. Amen. Are you still here? But oh, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of things that have happened in our camp meetings and some of our movements amen, through the years that I go to and I realize there's no longer a fire and all we're talking about is what happened 10 years ago or 50 years ago or 75 years ago when somebody started it. Amen. I believe God wants to do something right now. Amen. And God's fire that moves right now is not second rate. It's not inferior. It's not less than. Amen. The real fire of God is the same as it's always been. And if you'll put your sacrifice I love that song you sing put that Isaac on the altar amen and God will move and work in your life my friend thank you Jesus so he says to them and I think it's in respect I have no disrespect we all stand on the shoulders of great men he says take the ashes don't just kick them out don't just shovel them out and put them in the wind, but take those ashes and put them in a clean place. Put them there with respect. That's what I laid down yesterday. That's somebody's sacrifice. That's an animal that's life no longer is with us. Put that in a clean place with respect. Amen. God, help me to preach right now and get back to the tabernacle as fast as you can and put some more wood on that fire. Amen. And believe God to pour out another revival. Amen. How many believe we need revival in these last days? 
Amen. How many believe we really need a move of God in these last days? Amen. Some people do not keep their experience up to date, so they keep returning back to the ashes of their past, and they can never get past their past. Amen. It's dangerous to let our children know or even leave them an inkling that what we have now is a less than, and what we have now is inferior. God's fire will always be God's fire. Amen. Whether it comes on Mount Moriah, whether it comes, amen, over there where it Elijah was, or whether it comes on the day of Pentecost, ever how God does it, ever how it appears, it is genuine fire from God, and it comes from heaven, and it will help us to evangelize. Matter of fact, we cannot evangelize if we don't have the fire of God in our life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What I'm going to tell might be a little humorous if it wasn't so sad and so true. There was a great man that come through our area some years ago. Preached good, had some great revivals. Pastored a little church and folks got saved. When that man died, they found a picture, Pastor, and blew it up life size and cut out a cardboard piece with his picture on it. Propped it up in the pulpit and played tapes in the background over the speakers and tried to make people feel like that that man was still standing there. I want to tell you something. He might have been a good man. Matter of fact, he was. But God, amen, God wants to give you fire. That really, all that was was just some ashes from the past. I wonder tonight, am I helping anybody? Amen. My God is a consuming fire. Amen. God wants to do something now. Amen. A cardboard statue of a great man is not going to stand between the dead and the living. It's not going to bring revival to this generation. Oh, the great revivals in America. Amen. George Whitfield preached on these shores 200 years ago. Well, bless God. Who's preaching on them now? Amen. Northampton, Massachusetts. Amen. Great revival, George Whitfield. Uh, but a few years ago, there was an article in the paper uh, that said Northampton, Massachusetts was the lesbian capital of the world. Uh, my God, help us here today. Uh, if we ever will wake up and realize uh, that America needs revival uh, and the church has to bring it uh, and the preachers have to bring it uh, and the men of God have to stir us up uh, and we need to come to conferences uh, so we can stir each other's fire uh, and go back to our place and get something done for the kingdom of God. The great man that came, and his name's a little hard to say. Some of you have read it. He came not too long after the Revolutionary War. He traveled up and down the East Coast. And he made a statement, America's great because America is good. And he said, when America ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. But then he went on to answer the question, what is the secret to America? He said it is found in the pulpits of their churches. I mean, their churches are aflame with fire. Oh, God. Oh, help us here today, Lord. Hey, man, I need to help somebody here tonight. In, say, in Leviticus chapter number 9, verse 24, And there came fire out from before the Lord and consumed the altar and the burnt offering and the fat. Amen. And the fat which when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Amen. I'm asking you again tonight, would you know the fire of God if it fell, if it fell tonight? Are you willing to lay your offering on the altar? Are you willing to lay your sacrifice down amen people that study the Bible more than I have said that fire that fell on that sacrifice that day even up until that time had been nothing but ordinary fire but this day there was a fire that the priest didn't put on the altar there was a fire that Moses didn't put on the altar there was a fire that came from heaven and it burned non-stop for 900 years amen until the children of Israel went into Babylonian capture. Uh, amen. God.
God help us here tonight. Uh, I believe God can start something right here. Uh, you can say it never happened in my church. Uh, if you'll get a fire in you uh, and put it on the altar uh, and take it back to your church uh, and let your pulpit become a flame, uh, I do believe that God uh, can use you and your ministry and your church to turn the world around. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. The revivals of George Whitley, Whitfield, John and Charles Wesley, Dwight Moody. They're my heroes and they're yours. But they're not getting our children saved in this generation. Amen. Can you take a little more? Amen. Let me tell you something else. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. There's a lot of things I could say, but I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to move on for the sake of time here. But you'll find some more about this in Numbers chapter 16. Let me preface it just a little bit here. There was a man of renown, a man of God, that had other men with him that seemed to know something about God. I'm telling you, when you start messing with God's fire, you start messing with God's man. God is protective of his fire. And God's men should be protective of God's fire. Can somebody say amen? amen. Praise God. A man named Korah rose up. He was a good man. He was a Levite. He, he had all, all their credentials. But he got in Moses' place. Amen. It wasn't Moses that done it. Come on church, stay with me just a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to be preaching too much longer. Amen. But God didn't take kindly to it. And because of Korah's rebellion, the ground opened up. Oh God. Be careful how you treat this man. Be careful what you say about this man. Be careful what you say about his family. Amen. Oh, yes, sir. Amen. And there was numbers of people, thousands of people that died when the, when the ground opened up and just swallowed them up. But that wasn't the end of it. Those that God had knew that their hearts had been with Korah and his men, the plague began to fall on the camp. And thousands, 14,000 plus were dying of the plague. My God, that plague was killing them like flies. Amen. And when they realized it was going on, the man of God, Moses, said to Aaron, go quickly. Can I read it real quick here? Amen. Verse number 46. And Moses said unto Aaron, take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them for there is wrath gone out from the Lord. Lord, the plague has begun. I wish God had helped me to preach this right now. The plague has begun. Amen. It's not cancer. It's not AIDS. Amen. It's not diabetes. Amen. It's not Ebola. You know what it is? It's sin. And sin's been working a long time. And sin is destroying the fabric. Amen. And I want to tell you something. There is a remedy for sin. There's a remedy for the deterioration that sin brings to churches uh, and ministries and nations uh, but God's fire uh, the real fire uh, the Holy Ghost fire uh, is the only fire that will stand between the living Oh, hallelujah. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. Amen. And behold, the plague had begun among the people and he put it in sense and made an atonement for the people and stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. Amen. Aren't you glad for Holy Ghost fire then? Aren't you glad for the real deal then? When things are happening and you can't do anything about it and our children are dying and the enemies destroying them and our churches are being divided amen you know what we need we need the real fire of God from off the holy altar and run into our communities and run into our churches and run into our pulpits preachers and hold up the censer with the holy fire and stand between the dead Amen. There's good people. There's people that know a lot. There's people that know how to have oratory skills. But then nothing will ever take the place of a real man of God with the censer and the holy fire on it that will stand between the dead and the living. And God's holy fire is the only thing that will take a stand and stop the plague. 
Oh, I'm feeling like preaching and I need to hurry. The plague has begun. I wish I could drive that home here tonight. Uh, hey Amen. That's the reason the devil's bothering your family, brother. The plague has begun. Uh, it started years ago. Uh, what are we going to do about the plague? Uh, we're going to have to run into the altar. Hey Amen. My God, I wish I could preach in here tonight. Uh, there's somebody that's letting yours die low, uh, and you're trying to live off the ashes of the past, uh, and all of a sudden something's going to happen, uh, and you're going to run into your altar, uh, and you're going to look around and say, Oh no, uh, has it been two weeks since I've been in here has it been a month since I've been in here and there's no fire on the altar where's the fire where's the fire I got help I need help I need to run out and stand between the the dead and the living and I run to my altar and there's nothing on it nothing but ashes oh God let me talk to you right now London England The bubonic plague, better known as the Black Death. 450 people a day were dying in London, England. It was a midst of a plague that the king couldn't stop. Preachers couldn't stop. Doctors couldn't stop. There was nothing they could do about it. They couldn't even, they could not even keep up. The morgues couldn't keep up. They couldn't process the the dead long enough. I mean, quick enough. Off times in that plague. Children, siblings in a family. And they would have a funeral for one. And they would get back home from the funeral. And another one would be feverish. And they knew what it was. I read a book one time called The Fire and the Plague. I I tried to think of it this evening while I was studying on this, about this message. And during during church it came back to me, the title of that book. And if you you love things like this, you'd, you'd enjoy reading it. I mean, you've heard of the Renaissance, the Renaissance era, Renaissance, uh, Renaissance architecture, Renaissance structure. I, mean, I know some of you know this, but some of you probably don't. That was because after what happened in London, England, that's when the Renaissance began. Sir Christopher, it's hard for me to say that word, Wren had to completely rebuild the city. Amen. The plague had begun. Amen. What I was, what I was uh, odd to find, Brother Philip, was in that book, as you open the page, this, one of the first pages, there was a little thing there that's familiar to all of us. The words were a little bit different. But it, it was the words to the song we all learned when we were small. It was ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Amen. Little children as little children will be, no matter what's going on, little children will be little children. In the midst of that plague, when other little children their age were falling down dead with the plague, they're the ones that come up with that song. It was a horrible death. Your lymph nodes all over your body swelled. You had great sores that would come out on your body. And, and, and they, they looked like large flowers. You actually, you, actually, you actually died while you lived. There was a stench that went along with that disease as you died. So the little children would put posies in their pocket, little flowers, to try to overcome that stench. And so they come up with that song. Ring around the rosy. It was a little sore on their hand. There would be a ring around it. When they realized they had the, the ring and the little rose flower, that after a while they'd be carrying posies in their pockets. And in a day or two or three, they would fall down dead. Oh, are y'all still here? I've already told you. The king was helpless. Doctors were helpless. Preachers. I mean, you, you can read, and I know as much as you read, you probably read all this, Pastor, but there, there, there were pastors that basically lost their entire congregation with the plague. They could do nothing about it. Amen. But one day, are y'all still here? <laughs> oh, you're kind of quiet now. One day, one day, a fire started down on the docks on the east side of London. The wind picked it up and began to, uh, began to sweep across that city. Basically burned that whole city to the ground. People had to flee out of that, uh, out of that city for their lives. Uh, y'all can read it. You can go get, get that book and read it if you don't believe what I'm telling you. Amen. But you know what? 
when the fire was over and the cleanup began and everybody moved back to town, they realized the plague was gone. <laughs> oh, wish somebody would shout hallelujah here. Amen. You know what took the plague out? The fire stood between the dead and the living. That's all right. You can give God a hand clap of praise. I want to tell you, plague is sin. Sin is the plague. The plague has begun. It's eating away at our nation. It's eating away at our families. It's eating away at our churches. But I tell you, church and pastors and people, we can change it this week in this conference in Richmond. We can get the ashes of the past. That's the way we used to do it. That's the way Grandpa done it. That's the way they did in Brush Arbor days. I tell you what we need to do. We need to clean the ashes off our altar and say, God, show me what you want me to do. And I'll be willing to do what you want me to do. Amen. Amen. The fire is to enable us and mobilize us to evangelize the world. The fire is also to pur purge and purify the church like I just illustrated with you with the plague. Amen. One final point and I'm almost done. Almost done. Amen. The other part is to prepare us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. For Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, in those days, I will liken it to, you remember that. Amen. There were ten virgins. I'm almost done. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Amen. They all went out to meet the bridegroom. Amen. Five of them took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Five of them did not. They all slumbered and slept. I'm, I'm hurrying now. Amen. But at midnight, there was a cry made. Amen. Oh, somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Amen. Pastors are already told us. And, and, and he heard me. He'll verify it. I've been, I've been making that same request at the home church, haven't I? Amen. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I've been telling folks to do that right now while, 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 while uh, Israel's under attack. Uh, amen. While precious Christians uh, that a lot of you probably wouldn't have any confidence in uh, are stranded on a mountain uh, uh, taking a stand for the name of Jesus. Uh, I tell you what the church of God better do. Uh, we better realize we are in the last and final days uh, and we better get some oil in our vessels with our lamps. Uh, we better make a difference right now. Amen. Because Jesus Jesus is coming. We're almost ready for the cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And they that were ready went in with him. And the door was shut. We're just right there. Amen. Brother Robbie, I'm so glad you and Sister Judy came to be with us. Oh, God, help us here tonight. Can I just talk to you and preach to you? We're almost ready. We're almost there. If we're ever going to get back to our home church and have revival and see a move of God and let the Holy Ghost use us for what it was intended to do, to mobilize, evangelize, purify, and get us ready. Amen. How many knows that Jesus is coming after a church that has made themselves ready? I know. I've heard it. You've heard it too. We're all going to be beat down. Just going to be a few of us left. And just going to be a few of us holding out, bless God, to the end. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Jesus Christ is not coming back to this earth to go on a honeymoon with a bride that's beat up and beat down and on life support and just about to draw her last breath. I tell you what he's coming after. He's coming after a church. Amen. That's up and about the Father's business. And souls are getting saved. And things are happening. And we're making a difference. That is the church. Amen. He's going on a honeymoon with a bride that has made herself ready. She's in the prime of her youth. She's ready to meet the Son of God. Amen. She's ready and strong and worthy. Oh, wish somebody give God some praise. Right. Uh, amen. We need to worship Him. Uh, the cry is going to be made. Uh, we're almost there. It's almost time. Uh, the signs are all in place. Uh, are we going to be ready? Oh, don't be like the foolish. I don't know. I've used this illustration a few times, but it's been a long time. I'm closing with this little illustration. I know some of you read after this man. Reverend Barnhouse had a church 
over in Pennsylvania, brother. Great illustrator. But here's what he said happened in his church. Hey, man, you've heard me tell it, Brother Robbie. A family on vacation. Somebody's getting us a song. I'm almost done. I'm, I'm, I'm real close. And uh, the family was gone. A white man and father, two children. They're coming back home, driving through the mountains of Pennsylvania. They come up to the, to the railroad crossing. Way out in the country. No lights, no electricity. It's back in the days of the old, what they call the old-fashioned signal man that stood by the railroad crossing to flag the traffic when the train's coming through the cut. Are y'all still here? And so the night came. The family's driving away in the night trying to get back home, Sister Joanne. And they come up on the, the crossing and the, and the train is already on the tracks. The car with the family creamed into the, into the train. Everyone in the car was killed. There's no witnesses save only the signal man that's standing there holding his lantern to wave the traffic. I'm trying to make a point here tonight. If God, I, I just want God to speak to us here tonight. I, know I didn't come to Richmond to waste time. I didn't come here to preach tonight to waste your time. But I've come here tonight to stir my heart. Amen. Oh, I love you so much, Brother Edsel. Looking forward to you being with us. Amen. Here in a few weeks, I want God to do something in my family. I've been praying for you, brother. We're standing with you. And we pray for these churches. We're believing God to do something in these last days. But I'm telling you, we have a responsibility. If, if the church is aflame of, 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 uh, and our ministers are on fire and people from other countries knew what the difference was in our nation, it was because of the fire in the pulpits. We must go to our pulpits with a godly censor with godly fire and stir our people to pray and seek God and remove the ashes. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> Other close family members of that family said we know something's wrong. Something's not right. Our family would have never done that. They were a safe driver. That would not have happened. Amen. So they take the railroad company to court. Their day comes in court. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping. I'm, I'm just trying to hurry now. But please understand, you'll, you'll get the point here. The day came. They prepped the only witness they had. Yeah. They took the signal man aside. The defense did. And they said to him, you do not give any answers. You answer only the questions you are asked. You be courteous. You answer with yes, sir, and no, sir. Don't elaborate. Don't tell any more. Make them ask you the questions. You answer the questions only in that way. He's the only witness they have. The day for the family is in court. The only witness is standing there. And they said to the signal man, was the train crossing the tracks on this day, this night? He said, yes, sir, it was. He said, did you see the car coming? Yes, sir, I did. Did you wave your lantern, signal man? He said, yes, sir, I did. Case closed. The family lost. Railroad company won. The man's back on his job the next day. And, and his, his fellow employees are high-fiving him. You done great. Man, you done great. You done good. You operated good under pressure. We were all watching. We were wondering. Oh, man, you don't understand. I was scared to death. Oh, no, you never showed it. Man, you don't understand. I was scared to death. Oh, man, well, why, why, why was you scared? He said, I was so afraid their attorney was going to ask one more question. And this is it. Was your lantern lit? I knew that train was crossing the tracks, he said. I saw that car coming. And he said, I picked up my lantern. And as I picked it up and swung it up, the fire went out. I forgot to fill my lantern. Oh, God, help us here. 
Church, are you getting my point? Are you feeling my heart here tonight? I'm going to too many camp meetings uh, where there's too many people. They're standing behind the pulpit uh, and they're swinging an empty lantern uh, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, we're purifying our doctrine. Uh, there's no holes in our doctrine. Uh, we're working on somebody else. Uh, we're perfecting holiness in somebody else. Uh, but I'm wondering, my friend, uh, is there a fire in our belly? Uh, is there a fire in our eyes? Uh, is there a flame in our heart? Uh, is there something in us uh, that when we stand up on Sunday morning uh, and we wave the gospel lantern uh, is there anybody moving uh, is there anybody taking note uh, is there anybody looking around to see is my lantern lit yeah. oh God help us here tonight I'm tired of running into people. I'm tired of butting heads with people. Uh, I'm tired of having accidents. Uh, I'm tired of singing ring around the rosy. Uh, I'm ready to see God do a work uh, in these last days uh, that will transform our nation uh, and our churches. Bless God. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, help us, Jesus. My grandfather told me, drove a ga gasoline transport for many years, got up way before dawn. Y'all have people ready to sing? Yes. There had been a storm during the night, Brother Etzel. All the power was out. He said, I didn't have a flashlight and, and, and nothing to, to go with. He said, I was walking down the sidewalk. And he said, I ran into another man. He said, we hit each other so hard that both of us, man, he said, nearly knocked the breath out of me. He said, we just stepped around each other. Walked on, never said a word to each other. Anyway, I tell you, folks, <clears throat> that little accident could have been avoided if just one of them would have had a light. We're butting heads. We're wondering who's going to preach the meetings. We're trying to think of something to elevate us a little bit higher to get us noticed. I'm telling you, God is not interested in putting His fire on the flesh. He's only going to put it on the altar of sacrifice. I wish somebody would shout hallelujah in this place. We need to stand all over this house tonight. I hope your heart has been challenged here tonight. We need to think about this.